Hello, everyone. I'm Brian Gussie, the Director of the Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production, which is also the administrative home to the People's Garden. The People's Garden was named in honor of USDA's founder, President Abraham Lincoln, who described USDA as the People's Department because food and agriculture impact everyone living in our great nation. Secretary Tom Vilsack broke ground on the People's Garden back in February 12th of 2009. Lincoln's 200th birthday. The People's Garden Initiative is managed by my office, the Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production. The office was established through the 2018 Farm Bill. It's led by the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and we work in partnership with the Farm Services Agency and numerous other USDA agencies to support urban agriculture and innovative production. The mission of OUAIP is to encourage and promote urban, indoor, and other emerging agricultural practices, including community composting and food waste reduction. In May of 2022, Secretary Vilsack announced the reopening of the U.S. Department of Agriculture's People's Garden Initiative. The garden here at USDA's headquarters in Washington, D.C. has been joined by flagship gardens located in urban communities nationwide. Additionally, we are welcoming community gardens across the U.S. to join our larger network and register as People's Gardens, which you can do at the link in the chat. People's Gardens across the country will grow fresh, healthy food and support resilient local food systems, teach people, including and most importantly children, how to garden using conservation practices, nurture habitat for pollinators and wildlife, and create green space for neighbors. Many of you viewing this webinar are members of the People's Garden community, and I'm happy to welcome you to our National Garden Month webinar. We wanted to create this webinar series to celebrate community gardens and the great things being done in the communities across the U.S. with USDA support, as well as to inform the People's Garden Network about opportunities to grow, to join, grow, and teach. We hope this series of webinars provides valuable information about gardening and other opportunities for U.S. government support and evolves into a community of gardeners who not only learn from the webinars, but also connect and learn from one another. To me, that is going to be the lasting legacy of the People's Garden. So just as a reminder, the chat function will not be available during this webinar, but we encourage you to use the Q&A function to share comments with the presenters or one another. I am excited to introduce Mrs. Christy Vilsack, wife of Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, with a special message to kick off our webinar series and National Garden Month. Hello and welcome to the People's Garden in Washington, DC, right outside USDA headquarters. I'm Christy Vilsack, wife of Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack and an Iowa Master Gardener. I'm so excited to be here today during National Garden Month to kick off our new People's Garden webinar series. These webinars will feature experts from USDA and beyond who will share gardening tips and point you to the resources that may benefit your community garden. We'll also share on the ground stories of gardens making a difference by growing fresh, nutritious food for their communities. Special thanks to those of you joining today who are affiliated with the Patrick Leahy Farm to School Program or are part of the community of over 1,200 People's Gardens across the country. If you're not yet part of the People's Garden community, I invite you to join, grow, and teach with us by signing up your garden on our website, usda.gov peoplesgarden. You can find a link in the chat. We are doing it. <laughs> Gardening has always been important to my family. I started gardening when I was growing up in Iowa. Our family depended on our garden for food. We didn't buy vegetables at the grocery store. My mother made food prep more fun by inviting the neighbor children to our garage on hot summer days to shell peas. Now every August, our grandchildren come next door to help me and Tom shuck Iowa sweet corn for freezing. As with my family, there's a rich history of home, school, and community gardens in the United States. Whether you grow food for your family or participate in your community garden, our message to you today is anyone can garden, even if you don't have your own patch of green. 
USDA funds extension services in each state, which offer master gardener programs, teaching residents knowledge and skills to expertly garden where they live. And master gardener graduates give back to their communities by volunteering in local gardens. You can find more information in the link in the chat. Since graduating from the Master Gardener program, I've been volunteering at gardens in my community in Iowa and here in DC. I live in a forested area in Iowa, so I can't have my own garden. Instead, I volunteer with my granddaughter in the school pollinator garden. I also work in the cutting garden at the county extension office and continue to take classes there to learn more about flowers and tree grafting. Thanks for joining today, and I hope you enjoy the webinar and others in the series. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to my good friend, Rose Hayden Smith, the historian, author, and national expert in the history of gardening, victory gardens, and extension education. She's an Emeritus University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources Cooperative Extension Advisor. Rose, the floor is yours. I'm Rose Hayden Smith. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about cultivating possibility. So we find ourselves in this post-pandemic uh, post uh, period, and there are so many challenges that we face, um, social, economic, environmental, and we're deeply divided. But I think also that many of us, most of us, have a renewed appreciation for the things and the places that are most important in our lives and our communities, and things and places that provide possibility. And for me, and I know for you, gardens are places that provide potential and opportunity and great possibility for us. Um, growing fresh food together, nurturing one another, learning together, making the world a better place one garden at a time. Um, there are um, so many ways to garden and places to garden. And so I'm going to ask Nina to advance my slide. Okay, ways to garden, in-ground gardens, raised bed, containers, windowsill gardens, hydroponics, but we don't need things that are fancy or expensive, right? We can, we can find many ways to do this. In terms of places, oh my gosh, um, there are uh, in, um, Nina, could you please advance the slide? Thanks. We, home, right? Schools. I am so excited to see school gardens coming back after a sort of pandemic hiatus. Uh, we have community gardens. There are so many other community places to garden as well. Um, in my community, um, there are a number of gardens at churches that are open to the public to set up and do gardening there. There are also parks. There are libraries. Um, one of my favorite things in the past are the sort of public gardens that model after the People's Garden, right? Which is in on our National Mall, which might be arguably one of the most sacred places in American life, the National Mall. And so I've seen gardens at city halls um, in public places. And so go find a place where you want to garden, seek partnerships, and let's get growing. A garden for everyone and everyone in a garden. Um, okay, next slide. Um, there are so many resources to support your work. There is the People's Garden website. And as Mrs. Vilsack, who is a certified master gardener, shared with you, there are going to be monthly webinars. There are going to be webinars about pollinators and all sorts of other things. So be sure to join us every month for the monthly webinar. The USDA website is probably my favorite website in the world. It is packed full of treasures. Um, everything from not only gardening information, but information about nutrition. Um, there are fitness applications and counters. There are recipes. There are all sorts of things, food conservation, 
food preservation. Go explore it, bookmark it, take a look every day. There are wonderful things. There are maps and things um, that you can also share with children to help them sort of learn along with you. Um, I'm really excited and I know that the People's Garden staff will be sharing more with you later. Um, there is a new online community, Connect. And it's a, a place for people involved in the People's Garden Initiative to come together in, in, in a social place and share resources with, uh, with, the, uh, with one another, learn what's working um, and get calendar events going and sign up for things and, and just become more familiar with the great work that everyone is doing in their gardens. The master gardeners, near and dear to my heart, 84,000 certified master gardener volunteers in the United States, and um, encourage you to check out your state and local master gardener website to see the resources that are available and go beyond your state to see what might be available. There are master gardener programs that have got vegetable courses, uh, vegetable production courses online. There are some master gardener programs that have school garden resources that even though you live in a different hardiness zone, they may have resources to help you with your school garden. So go check out the master gardeners. Next slide. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history. This is one of my favorite posters and images ever. It is a USDA image that was produced by a USDA artist in World War I. And Uncle Sam says garden. And um, I, I want you to see really quickly, if you look at the, the little pamphlet that Uncle Sam is holding, city gardens, farm gardens. Wherever we live in the United States, in the city, on a farm, anywhere in between, we can all garden and we can sort of share that um, collective sense of accomplishment and wonder at the work of gardening. I also love this image because if you look at what's growing in the field, it's in the shape of an American flag. And um, you can go look at these images on the Library of Congress website, which is another American treasure. Next slide, please. So um, history echoes and rhymes. And um, I, I just uh, want to show you these images here. The image on the right, the dragon carrot, I took that with my, um, with my phone. Uh, when I went on a visit to the People's Garden in 2012, I also visited in 20, um, 2009, right after they broke ground, and a couple of other times. And then on the same visit, I went to the White House Garden. That's the one on the left. Um, I love the image on the bottom because um, that is um, a, an early last century image of uh, land being cultivated outside of the uh, Witten Building in Washington, D.C., home of the USDA. So, um, you know, the United States, gardening is a persistent activity. We love gardens. Uh, we have uh, colonial kitchen gardens and um, urban relief. I mean, a lot of people are very su surprised that um, there was um, a sort of enormous surge in urban gardening in the 1890s um, when um, in an economic downturn, uh, Detroit Mayor Hazen Pingree created the Detroit Experiment Potato Farms, Potato Patch farms. And the urban gardening movement spread across the United States like wildfire. And, and Detroit today is still one of um, the most sort of vibrant urban agriculture, um, you know, places in the United States. Absolutely wonderful things that have gone on there for a really, really long time. Um, when I began studying the history of school gardens, um, I was actually inspired because I stumbled on a letter that a teacher named Zilda Rogers, who taught at Ann Street Elementary School in Ventura, had written to the University of California um, in 
1909, sharing um, what she was doing in her school garden and how much the children were benefiting from it. And not only learning and, and then taking this garden idea home and cultivating gardens at home, but that they were becoming what she termed better friends and companions to one another. And that what they learned in the school garden also helped them in what they learned in the classroom. And um, that school has a school garden still today, right? So the school garden movement has been going on a long, long time in the United States. And again, I'm so excited that we're back in business after this pandemic. Um, we all know um, about the World War II Victory Garden Program, probably the most iconic home front mobilization program that actually had its roots in a World War I Liberty later Victory Garden program. And there was even a school garden piece called the United States um, School Garden Army. Um, we gardened during the depression and there were federal gardening programs um, that were delivered all over the United States. Um, the environmental movement brought a renewed interest in gardens. We had a, a big, interest again, big surge of school gardens in the 1990s and 2000s. And I'm in California. We even had an assembly bill, 1535, that funded that work. And then we saw, you know, the farm to school movement and um, the wonderful things that happened um, during the Obama administration with um, a sort of new White House garden and the USDA People's Garden. And I have such an affinity for this very sort of public civic minded agricultural work. It's wonderful. And we're all a part of that right now. Next slide, please. Okay. I'm, I want to share with you the Patrick Leahy Farm to School Program resources. Mrs. Vilsack talked about this a little bit in her video. And um, it, this is administered by the USDA Food Nutrition Service. It supports um, child nutrition program operators in procuring local foods for their meal programs, which has all sorts of benefits, helps local economies, improves nutrition, just a wonderful program model. Um, we also, through that program, um, teachers um, will be uh, and have been delivering um, agriculture and nutrition education and experiential activities through school gardens, which is very exciting. Um, if you visit the website, there are an abundance of resources to help you in your gardening work, uh, fact sheets, toolkits, guides, um, and you should really go visit the website. This is another one to bookmark, but the, I think the best way to stay up to date on all the farm to school program news is we all want the dirt, right? So subscribe to The Dirt, which is the monthly newsletter. It's got 120,000 subscribers and you'll learn all sorts of things. You can also get farm to school stickers to share with your students. Um, and uh, there is a QR code, get that right off of this. And so now you're gonna have an opportunity to hear about a couple of really terrific programs uh, from two of the Farm to School grantees, Renee Johnson and Chetna Mimi. And they're gonna be talking about their programs and it's an inspiration and it gives us all ideas on what's possible. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Renee Johnson, um, Lincoln County School District, Oregon Coast STEM Hub Coordinator. And um, also invite you to chat with me on social media. Find me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Mastodon, any place you are, I've probably got an account. And let's talk more in social settings and on Connect about school gardens. So now here's Renee. Thank you, Rose. Hi, everybody. I'm Renee Johnson. I work for Oregon State University. Um, today, I'm going to share a little bit about the school garden program in Lincoln County on the Oregon coast. 
I've been in the area for about five years and I met our superintendent, Dr. Gray, at a food security event in April of 2019. Uh, by January of 2020, we mapped out a plan. We'd secured funding from the Oregon Department of Education to kick off a program. I write and I apply for all the funding for the program, uh, but I do apply for the funds in the name of the school district really to ensure buy-in and ownership of the program while still being able to support their efforts as an outsider. We hired Sarah Gibson to be our school garden coordinator in March of 2020, enter the COVID-19 pandemic. Our schools closed a week after she started. So our program's taken a lot of turns. It's been chaotic at points over the last three years, um, but ultimately our goal has always been to create a sustainable program um, where we model lessons for teachers so that they feel comfortable running themselves in the future. Sarah is the heart and soul of the program, and USDA funds primarily supported her position in the 21-22 school year, uh, which is also when we decided to shift our model from, you know, primarily educational with a lot of food being donated to an educational model coupled with production um, so that our food's being served in cafeterias. Uh, the goal behind that is to increase participation in our school meals program, and that's exactly what we've seen. Um, and as a result, Lincoln County School District sees the value in the program um, and really is appreciative of all the work that Sarah does. They've hired her on full time as a permanent staff member um, and created an eight year plan to expand gardens to all our schools in the districts. So she now works as a part of our child nutrition services team. And she wasn't able to be here today, but since she's such an instrumental part of the program, I asked her to create a short presentation for you all about it. I hope you enjoy it. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Gibson and I'm located in Lincoln County on the Central Oregon coast. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share about our school garden program and what we were able to accomplish with our USDA garden grant. I am proud and thankful to serve the students and families in our school district. This slide shows where we started in 2019. Um, an amazing community member named Renee Johnson worked with our local schools to write uh, Oregon Department of Education grant for two school gardens and a job description for a school garden coordinator. Renee is still a ardent supporter of the school gardens and is an important part of our coordination team. I was hired to get the program started and we wanted to create a living uh, classroom in the form of a school garden and grow food and joy and community. And then there was the COVID pandemic. Everything shut down the week after I started at the district. And so it was a, it was a rough start. Uh, here's a few COVID closure highlights. Um, lots and lots of Zoom lessons, um, cooking videos and social media updates. It was lonely building the garden by myself, uh, but the district said to persevere, keep building it and document everything. So we were able to donate over 500 pounds of food that summer um, and went back into our community during the shutdowns. Um, when we finally got the gardens all finished and the students came back, uh, that's when it really got fun. The main goal during our, UDS, our USDA grant was to model garden-based education to our classroom instructors. Uh, our strategy was to create garden experiences that support our teachers and don't add more to their already heavy workloads. I love the uh, educational aspect of gardening and I worked with our TOSAs, teachers on special assignments and our district curriculum specialist on how I could align our programs to current standards. I also reached out to our SEL uh, specialists to write programming that aligned with what they were trying to accomplish um, with the SEL programs so that we were meeting the needs of the whole child and um, using the garden as a place for peace and healing and happiness as well as learning and nutrition. So here's just some slides of some of the highlights of the things that we were able to do in the garden. Um, and our hope was that the students would become stakeholders in their health and nutritional well-being. Um, so we worked with our cafeterias and did a lot of tastings in the garden and we cooked with the classes that we could. And I also used um, lesson plans that were already made from organizations like Oregon Agriculture in the Classroom, 
Food Hero Resources and Science in the Learning Gardens for older classes and also the Seed to Supper manual walked us on through how to design a garden and plant the garden. And that way the students worked from the ground up through the whole process. Here's some soil samples the middle school students took. Um, I wonder if you can guess which sample was from their garden beds. So modeling math in the gar garden. We literally measure everything. Um, as you can see in this picture, uh, the kids think that a ruler is my favorite gardening tool. And when they see me pull that ruler out, they know things are gonna get serious. More measurements, we, we weigh everything that comes um, into the school cafeteria so that at the end of the year, we can look at um, how much food we grew and be amazed. Uh, one of the really beautiful parts of our garden is using it to explore cultures and social emotional learning. Um, and you can see in this picture, our three sisters gardens and the kids are learning about seed savings and how foods traveled all over the world. And, and um, we wanna connect what we're growing, the herbs and the flowers and the plants to um, cultures that we see represented in our communities today. Here we've got corn that the children grew in their three sisters garden and they were able to dry it and then select seeds for saving and sharing and then we ground the rest into cornmeal and I think it had to be the very best cornbread I've ever had. Art in the garden. It's another way we can integrate um, learning into the garden is through art and experience and sometimes um, we make culinary art like the middle school focaccia bread they made with herbs and flowers. So here's beautiful examples of nutrition in the garden. You can see the kids um, harvesting and preparing the produce to be brought into our cafeterias. And um, we have this beautiful partnership with our food service company, which is Sodexo. Um, and in our schools, no matter how large or small our harvest is, they turn it into something that goes onto our lunch line. And you can see how beautiful our school lunches are at Newport Middle School. And I would consider Newport Middle School our flagship school. Um, they were one of the original gardens we started. It was the little bare patch of earth in the first slide. Um, and you see in the first on the left, there's microgreens and that salad mix that the students have grown. There are edible flowers in there. There's fresh herbs in the next picture for our, uh, from their hydroponic towers. And then, um, the picture on the right is seasonal veggies that the kids harvested and brought into the cafeteria. So we're very, very lucky and spoiled by our amazing chefs. So here's our huge shout out um, to our kitchen staff. Um, it costs them a bit of time and effort to work with these students and invite them into the process of feeding a school. And um, they just lovingly prepare anything the kids Bring and they show so much gratitude. And so we're just so fortunate to have this partnership. So successes, um, <laughs> I would say um, our success is measured in our students' success. But even though our program got off to a really slow and rocky start, the school district recognized the power that school gardens had in supporting the students' mental and physical health. And at the end of our USDA grant, I was surprised and humbled to find out that the school gardener, school garden coordinator position would become a permanent position under the banner of nutrition services. So now I'm part of a team <laughs> and the input, creativity and experience our nutrition service team brings to the garden program is allowing it to grow sustainably and be successful in the long run. Our mission statement is grow foods, grow minds, feeding our future. So we're seeing an increase in kids eating lunch at the middle school and you saw the beautiful salad bar and the kids are trying new things and expanding their palates and they're having fun in the garden and um, most everybody can find something they love to do out there in our school garden. Okay, so successes. Students spent time building gardens and learning to grow food. If you asked the kids, they'd say that was their favorite parts. Um, for me, I saw kids eating kale. That was a huge accomplishment. I can't overstate how amazing it was to see kids try stuff that they would never try on a plate in a building. Um, 
and our school district is expanding its garden programs. They actually um, expanded our middle school gardens footprint and we are adding some fruit trees and um, it's just amazing. So I would call these all successes. And this is because um, there's so much value in the school garden program. So um, we are also working on a district-wide garden resource site for our K-12 teachers just to support them so they don't have to search around for information on how to do these lessons with their students. Um, and we've also been forming partnerships with different district programs in the garden program. And that's neat to see the integration um, and how that's gonna help serve our students even more and get more nutritious foods um, to families. So now we're gonna go to challenges and how we're meeting them. <laughs> we have the obvious challenges of trying to run a garden program on the Oregon coast. Um, it rains all the time and sometimes it feels like it will never stop. And so um, we have to adapt and do things differently. Uh, for our district, we have a lot of hydroponic towers. We have um, eight towers currently running at four different schools and this allows students to grow food year round and <laughs> Having one of these towers around just makes you feel so happy and um, the classes that are hosting these towers love them and they just pump out a ton of fresh greens and herbs. Um, you can see our little classroom aquaponics tank over there. That's Cobra Bubbles, our school fish. And um, also with our terrible winters, sometimes we just have to figure out ways to adapt and sometimes just go outside. Um, and here we have pictures of needle ice and somebody donated warm caps to the kids. So another challenge is high staff turnover. Um, so that's a huge challenge. Right when I get all the lessons modeled, um, we have a huge new amount of staff. So um, I try to attend staff meetings, sending out monthly emails seems to help. And I've got a Google folder so that teachers can plan off of that. All right, I just wanna say thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. And um, I love to share about what's happening in our school district. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Chatna Nemi. I am uh, connecting with all of you from the wonderful East Coast. We just heard about a, an awesome garden on the West Coast. And now we're gonna hear about an incredible program that's going on since 2017 in the heart of Boston. And my name is uh, Chetna Nemi. I'm the program coordinator for Farm to School, as well as the community partnership director. And I'm going to share a story today with pictures about how sure. an urban space can actually grow incredible amount of love and food at the same time and become a space for not just embracing growing healthy food, but for meditation, for a space for community to connect and so much more. So having said that, I'm going to share this presentation and um, So this is a story of a community that has persevered to build and sustain an urban vegetable garden. We are um, Codman Academy and Codman Square Health Center in the heart of Dorchester. Uh, just to give you a quick background of where our school is and who, is, who are our students in our population. Uh, the Codman Academy is 100% student of color, Black, Hispanic. 30% of our students come from families that have immigrated maybe in last five to six years. So they bring with them this amazing culture of um, their own um, in heritage and how they have grown food back in Jamaica or in Haiti or in um, Puerto Rico. So um, all students are on free USDA lunch. Um, the neighborhoods, if you guys know, some of you guys who know East Coast, are Dorchester, Metapan, Hyde Park, Roxbury. That's where our students come from. Uh, to give you an idea of who these students are and their families, the median household income is between 30 to 34K per year for our uh, families where our students are coming from. And um, it would not come as a surprise that there is a very limited access to healthy, fresh, and affordable food in these neighborhoods, along with safe outdoor playgrounds or garden spaces. 
This is a quick map. This is a Massachusetts map just to give you an idea of where we are. This little red dot on the right uh, in the middle of the map, you see that's Dorchester. That's the heart of Boston, one of the oldest and most vibrant neighborhoods in the country um, and one of the most diverse one as well. And um, so why pursue a garden? In 2017, we um, as a school, as a community health center, knew that it's time for us to have a garden. Um, we didn't always call it an urban garden, but we know that the purpose of a garden was to have this um, uh, education of young generation, that growing food is just as important as any other uh, academic learning we are doing in the classroom. Also, we wanted to bring the advocacy for growing food in urban spaces to our students into their homes uh, to make food justice and environmental justice a reality and to assist and empower our students to connect with local legislators. Uh, to teach them the art of cooking, which we think is inherently connected with growing your own food and understanding how food grows. So um, many of our students have absolutely loved how to cook because of the food that they are growing in our gardens. And of course, to harness the strength of our local and regional partners, there is no community without the partners, as we all know. So we have been able to harness that energy day in and day out. And um, something that we really take pride in is that we have been able to really promote urban agriculture and entrepreneurship among our high school youth. Um, as you will see, as, a, um, the, as I share further, that our young people are really starting to see agriculture as a possible profession, not just something that they do in the school. And of course, a space for community to gather. So this here, I'm going to give you a quick idea of where we were and how limited our space is. This is the back alley of our health center and our school. On the left side, you can see it was a complete junkyard back in 2017. And slowly, because of our farm to school grant, um, it gave us the platform, it gave us a voice, it gave us the funding, and we were able to turn this around, starting with a planning grant, and in 2020, we got a, a, an implementation grant. So here we get started with our work, and um, the garden was truly, if I want to use the word victory, was a victory to our student, for our students. Uh, young people, students uh, who are 13 to 14 to 20 years old, they all came together along with the health center staff. As you can see, this is a truly an urban space. There's a parking lot in the back. There is a health center van there. And our students, this is um, fall of 20. Um, 18, when our students came together. We also got some help with Green City Growers, this, who have been our partner, uh, a very um, strong partner whom, on whom we rely. And they were, as you can see, slowly the raised beds were built. We have been able to put in state-of-the-art um, watering system, drip irrigation system, because without that, it won't be possible. Um, the one on the right side, you can see, is the garden that was ready in 2018, 2019. That's the picture from that time. And we have been able to really create um, a, a meditation pergola in the middle uh, where staff from the school and the health center, where we share the space, they come and meet for, um, you know, just to decompress, to have lunch, to talk to each other. Uh, these are the spaces. And then we were able to actually take another spot right behind the parking lot and turn this into another raised bed garden. Um, all our high school students get a chance to work in this garden. Every single week, there is a group of students that works in the garden. And that's what we want is we want them to have that experience and not just a um, one off thing. Uh, the, uh, we have some amazing farmers who come to our school every week. Here is a, a farmer who comes from a, a farm called Holly Hill Farm and works with our students. Um, our doesn't matter which students, they are all working in the garden. And we know that this community garden is our outdoor classroom, whether it's art, music, bio, uh, food advocacy, and meditation and stress relief. We use our garden to every uh, way we can to grow our minds and bodies. Um, so we're talking about pandemic for a little bit. We're gonna talk about pandemics. So come fall of 2019, we created this awesome program that is still running till this day. It's called Codman Food Ambassadors. And it's a group of about um, 10 to 12 high school students who have now been 
in charge of always taking care of a garden. Uh, something that our previous presenter, Renee, mentioned was that who maintains the garden? Sometimes taking care of garden becomes everyone else's responsibility because teachers are busy and the staff is busy. So we started this program where our high school in, uh, students work during lunchtime. They get paid minimum wages. They love it. They come and maintain the garden. They become uh, mentors for the younger students. And uh, during pandemic, uh, we had this group work every single uh, week for three times a week and grow food. Um, as you can see, uh, each week we delivered almost 80 pounds of food to our healthcare workers, which are right at Carmen Square Health Center. And um, this is uh, some of the other um, students who are who, who worked in the garden before pandemic. Um, the uh, food ambassador program actually was uh, so well recognized that we received the 2021 President's uh, uh, Student and Teacher Environmental Award because of their um, dedication and work. Um, and I'm going to move forward with this. Um, I, uh, as we were saying, our garden is our learning, uh, our classroom, our outdoor classroom. Whenever. Our students can be outdoors. They all come outside, um, work with our farmer. Um, this is a quote which I have always loved. One of our students uh, who is in uh, now in fifth grade, but she was in third grade that time in 2018 uh, or 2020. She said, we'll plant a little bit, grow a little bit and eat a lot more healthy food. And that's, that's the spirit we want in our students. Uh, every single grade gets to come out. Um, this one here, they are, taught, they are planning the harvesting and planting of the seeds. Um, you give, they are learning about different herbs. Uh, here they are all um, busy using the flowers from our garden to make a petal collage. Um, we also don't leave our parents behind. Um, we have a very dedicated group of parents who work and volunteer in the garden, but also come for food tasting to interact with our students. Um, there is uh, another uh, looking at the harmful pest and beneficial bugs in the garden. Um, there is on the right side at the very top right picture, you can see uh, we have uh, an intern from who's doing her master's in nutrition. She worked with us. Uh, there are strawberries growing. There are every little nook and corner that uh, Mrs. Wals Vilsack was talking about that use every space to grow your food. And that's what we were um, uh, we have been able to accomplish. Um, again, talking about advocacy, our students have been able to go to the state house and talk about how important it is to have farm to school programs in schools because it brings that opportunity that will be not used if we didn't have um, access to state how to our local legislators are these are our fourth and fifth graders that they went to uh, the state house to talk about um, farm to school uh, and, and its benefits we have this incredible list of farm um, to school uh, partners uh, who provide us um, uh, access to healthy food not just in our garden um, so um, uh, what do we do in food advocacy? That we have farm food ambassadors. We have been connected with State House to talk about our uh, about the value of growing food in urban schools and how important it is to have access to local food. Uh, we have student-led fundraisers, fresh food tasting. Uh, we love to interview our farmers. And we also have student internships during summer months where students can come and work in the garden. Uh, these are some of the photographs from our uh, State House. Um, the, uh, um, some of the legislators that students met with. Um, this uh, photograph really brings me joy that you can see all the brain and the heart right in the garden, looking at the bugs, looking at what's going on in the garden. That's where um, we are making the true difference. Some of the harvest from our uh, school from last summer. Uh, we also have been um, able to grow a lot of food from our hydroponics and indoor growing racks, which has become a favorite project for our grade 11th and 12th students, especially those who are doing environmental AP environmental science and AP biology. So we are very proud of those students who have been able to take care of that. Here are students working on the indoor growing racks and um, they do supply a lot of microgreens. Uh, this was a science project where students actually built these um, cold frames and uh, to extend the growing season. And um, that has been uh, now being used during fall and uh, early winter months. 
Another program we were able to start because of our urban garden is a youth farmer's market. Most of the time schools don't have farmer's market, but we knew that if we want to promote urban entrepreneurship, urban agriculture entrepreneurship, we need to give our students a taste of how it is planned, how a, to make a business plan for a farmer's market. Um, we have a two small um, beehives on the roof of our school and students have been able to learn how to um, uh, sort of work with the bees, get their beeswax and the honey. And as you can see, now they have their own brand name, a uh, brand, and they have been super popular. Uh, we have some of our, this photograph actually shows some of the USDA staff from last year that came to visit. And um, um, here is our logo. One of our students uh, designed this Cardman Youth Farmers Market. And every week, regardless of the time of the year, we are having now Farmers Market. Um, so we have some, this is just a quick video. Yeah. Of mm -hmm. so, um, we're going to flowers. Oh, yeah. Spinach, four dogs, tomatoes. Mm -hmm. lettuce. Lettuce and so I um, just want to share some more pictures of our beautiful garden, which I'm always feeling so proud of. And um, some of our students working in the garden, as you can see, we were talking about the fundraising uh, last uh, year. Our students wanted to do fundraising for the prom and for graduation. So we got some fresh food from the garden, but we also got some fresh local food from uh, donated by the health center and the students made fresh healthy smoothies and uh, health center staff loved it. Our parents loved it. And um, that was a perfect example of like motivating students around healthy food, but also giving them that um, ability to say, we can, um, uh, we can actually accomplish um, what we set out to using our own uh, sources from our own garden. So that was one of the um, most joyful af Friday afternoon where students just worked from 9 a.m. till 4 p.m. making smoothies. Um, food tasting is an inherent part of our farm to school program. Nothing goes past our awesome food service director who uh, includes all our food. Uh, in fact, what she has been, what we have been doing with our garden is that whatever is growing in our small 900 square foot garden space, Ellen Nile, who is our food service director, she makes sure that she orders food based on what's growing in the garden. So if we are growing eggplants, we know we cannot grow enough eggplants, but we do know that they can order local eggplants. So then we can promote what's growing in the garden. And, um, uh, here are some of our students uh, interviewing a farmer. Uh, I, this is a photograph from our pandemic time. Um, and um, just uh, want to share that every school, every community can and should benefit from their own garden. Uh, nothing uh, brings more satisfaction, uh, a way to sort of relieve your stress. Uh, we do think that um, uh, our connection with our students, with the health center staff has really grown because of the farmer's market that we are doing, because of the food that we are growing, and because of the place that we have been able to beautify. Um, otherwise, it was just a, a place collecting junk, and now all of a sudden we have sunflowers, nasturtium, okras, green uh, tomatoes or tomatillas, and celery. And our students are tasting every one of these vegetables. They are not just growing it, they are actually taking out small little knives and just eating cucumbers and tomatoes right on the spot. Um, these are some of these, just a few of the fruits and vegetables. We had a, a big crop. I would not call it bumper, but definitely a crop of potatoes and students just loved cooking with potatoes. Um, our, one of our big uh, uh, mission has been in last two years since post pandemic is to reduce food waste uh, as much as possible. Uh, we have now three awesome compost bins in the school garden. We are doing warm composting in the youngest classroom. Our kindergarten through fourth grade has warm composting in each grade. Um, our farmer John and our biology teachers are leading the effort. We are also really trying to get rid of the single use plastic, which unfortunately was used during pandemic and a little bit post pandemic, but we are hoping to go back to purchasing and um, the uh, utensils that can be reused and washed. Um, so um, uh, what I would say is that the community gardens are the key to a healthy generation. Without them, we are only going to rely on trucks and delivery trucks to bring food, but we have the power 
our young people have the power to really put their hands in the dirt and make it turn it into gold. So um, everyone, uh, we strongly encourage, come talk to us if you ever want to learn more about urban spaces and how to squeeze out small spaces. Um, I also wanted to share that these are this is a beautiful mural that our students have designed. And, and uh, on May 12th, this Friday, our whole uh, community of students uh, from uh, high school students are coming together to put this mural on one of the concrete walls at the end of our garden space. Uh, once it's ready, I will love to share it with the um, uh, with the uh, wonderful team here and they can share it as well. Uh, thank you so much. Hello, y'all. Um, thanks so much. Uh, thanks to Chetna and uh, thanks to everyone for joining us today for the 200 of you that are still with us. We appreciate you. We're so grateful you're here. Um, I am again, Jen Ketchmark, and I. this uh, webinar series has been my special project I've been working on for the past few months. Uh, so just thrilled that you're here. Um, and the way that we're going to do the monthly webinar is at the end of each, uh, each session, we're going to have kind of a special recipe uh, that's on theme with the, with the topic that we've been discussing. So since this is National Garden Month, and we've had Christy Vilsack with us uh, earlier in the show. We're going to share her family's ketchup recipe. It doesn't always come from a bottle. Um, as a fellow Midwesterner, uh, Christy is from Iowa. I'm from Minnesota. I know how important ketchup can be to our regional sort of cuisine, because after all, what is tater tot hot dish without a little bit of ketchup on the top? So we hope that you will try out this recipe uh, after your summer harvest and let us know how it goes. Um, so to close us out, I want to thank our speakers today, uh, my boss, Brian Gussie, uh, Christy Vilsack, Rose Hayden Smith, Renee Johnson and Sarah Gibson from the Lincoln County School District, and Chetna Naimi from Codman Academy Charter School. Um, I am just going to take a moment to Chetna to point out that there's some questions for you in the Q&A. Um, if you can get back to folks, I know they've got a lot of questions on your uh, incredible presentation. And thanks to Renee for answering some of those questions as well. Um, we also thank you to Nina Bhattacharya and Jeff Davis for keeping things running in the background as we've been getting getting all the, uh, all the excitement of our uh, first webinar out. Um, so again, we are so excited to continue to grow the People's Garden Network, and we want to invite you again to sign up your community garden for the People's Garden Network, and um, we've put the link in the chat. I hope it's still there. Um, we want to continue to expand the reach of this webinar series and also to grow our interactive community um, on the People's Garden subgroup at extension.org. I'm going to push send so that this comes up hopefully to everyone right now. Um, we know Rose Hayden Smith has already said she's going to be there with some resources. We know that there's been folks who've been connecting with us in the chat, um, and we would love for you to connect there so we can really continue the conversation. Um, so finally, I want to, again, just thank you and say that we would love to hear your feedback. And we know there were a few bumps in this first webinar, but we appreciate you hanging in with us. Um, we would like to uh, offer up the email address of OUAIP at USDA.gov for any of your feedback. What went well? What do you want to hear about in future webinars? How can we improve? Um, what, any other questions you have, we, we, would, we would love to hear that feedback, but we want to connect with you on the, on the um, extension.org connect site. So thank you so much for attending. We will see you next month at our webinar on composting. Uh, have a great week and happy planting. Thank you so much.